Uh, my name is Bonnie Lipscomb. I'm Director of Economic Development. We also, uh, as part of our, our department, also has our wonderful housing division. And I just want to recognize our housing team. They're all at the back right now. <laughs> Jessica, Jess, Tiffany, and Andrea. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for coordinating this event and the wonderful food spread um, at the back from Los Pericos um, in Santa Cruz. So hopefully um, you haven't eaten and you um, have a plate of food. Uh, it's my pleasure today to have the opportunity to introduce Chuck DePew. Chuck DePew with National Development Council is, uh, has done many wonderful things for Santa Cruz over the years, and he actually started out, uh, well, not started out, but went to UCSC, um, and uh, so has ties to Santa Cruz dating back, I won't say how long. Um, he might tell us. But he understands the Santa Cruz market. Um, he's worked for National Development Council uh, for a few decades and um, has extensive experience both in affordable housing development, economic development, and has been a great resource for us um, over, about over the last decade um, here in Santa Cruz. Today's class, uh, which is the Affordable Housing Finance 101, is really the very, it really is a 101. It's the very basic of how you pull together and how a developer looks at a project from a perspective of moving forward or not. Chuck's going to walk you through some pretty complex things, but hopefully it, you know, he's going to do it in an understandable way and get you to a case study and then get you to a Santa Cruz example. And then um, if you all are interested, we hope we'll be able to follow up with a course 201, but we will also send you some follow-up materials from this meeting, um, some of the answers that go to your booklet, as well as some additional materials on actually financing some affordable housing projects in Santa Cruz, some real examples. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chuck DePue. Thank you, Lenny. Uh, a couple things, if you can, uh, don't sit at a table by yourself, because we're going to be doing group exercises. If you can move forward, that would be great, because then we expect, to be honest with you, another 500 people. <laughs> and we don't want them to all linger in the back, because they don't want to walk through you to get to the front table. Uh, because we are going to kind of do some, uh, you know, a couple of cases where you're actually going to use a pencil. Uh, if you haven't seen pencils in a while, this is a pencil. It's actually wrapped by chair. Uh, we're going to actually work through some cases and, you know, and play with some numbers and move things around. Because what we wanted to do with Bonnie as part of your housing month is we wanted to just do kind of a real estate overview. You know, kind of how do these systems, how do these structures basically work? And really come at it from a layperson's term. As Bonnie mentioned, I started at UC Santa Cruz on the fighting banana slug. Uh, I put myself through school working at Palace Art Office Supply. So all of you need to be shopping at Palace for any of your art office supplies. <laughs> Uh, and it'll be top quality. But I was, I was an environmental planning student at UC Santa Cruz. And they kind of got kicked out of town by my professor to, to go off and do some other things. So I went up to the University of Washington uh, and got a master's in urban planning. Uh, and then went to this, worked for the city of Seattle doing planning, community planning work. And like most community planners, they be somewhat frustrated uh, with plans not getting done and why aren't developers doing what we tell them to do. It must be because of the tax code or some reason it's not the plans. Uh, and so I started trying to figure out things and kind of following the old adage out of, uh, out of the water heater to follow the money. <coughs> now, now I'm a plan. Environmental planning at Santa Cruz, urban planning at the University of Washington. So I went to the finance educational background. So I took classes at NDC. I was lucky I worked for the city of Seattle, which is a relatively large city, doing a lot of things. So I think we went to meetings. Nobody understood why I was there. But Seattle's a relatively polite town, so nobody picked me out. So I could learn a lot of things around real estate. Then I took some classes that reaffirmed some of that, and then I actually started doing some real estate. And when I left the city, I had been the deputy director of the Seattle's Office of Economic Development, where I managed most of Seattle's community finance programs for a long time. Joined NBC, we're a national nonprofit based out of Evil, New York. But I work out of Seattle, I actually live on Bainbridge Island. Uh, we moved to Bainbridge Island because it reminded me and my wife of Santa Cruz in a lot of ways. She managed the art supply store for Palace Art Supply. So if you need the art supply, buy the Palace Art Supply. <laughs> Can't emphasize that enough. Um, but with NBC, we're a national nonprofit. We basically work with governments around the country on finance, usually where there's public money and a private transaction. 
complementing that mission, we do a lot of training. So we do about, uh, we've trained about 75,000 professionals. So this is some of the metrics. And a lot of our client teams, we actually do transactions. So we advise, we train, so that's where I learn my finance. But then in some cases, in Santa Cruz, we have a growth Seattle fund. That's a small business loan program. We have an SBA lending license. We have different entities that invest in low income housing tax credits, historic tax credits, new markets. We build a lot of projects for government. So we're active in, in real estate. We advise cities around real estate. Uh, and then we train people around finance. So for today, we want to walk through just the basics. And we're not trying to get to any kind of special technique or special programmatic approach to affordable housing. We're trying to look at kind of basic real estate. And you know how to approach real estate and the right language around real estate. So you can feel confident with that language and then get engaged in conversations. And the primary premise is what can the market do? And you see bias, public funds are challenged. A lot of times we're not giving our governments a lot of money to play with. We hold them very accountable, those dollars are scarce dollars. So how can we get someone else's money in before the public money has to go in? So we're really trying to work at the, on the private side as best we can, trying to make it do what we can get it to do before we have to co commit public resources so we can at least maximize the benefit of public resources. So this is going to be awkward because this is fixed, but I'm a pacer. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. So, what is the housing problem? Now, again, I came from Santa Cruz. Now, your problems are actually very similar to the problems I worked on in Seattle, which is also experiencing significant growth. Also very similar, I worked in Jackson Hole for a number of years, where a lot of your problems are similar to ski areas and other kinds of things. So Santa Cruz is always unique, but you have similarities with a lot of other places as well. So the problem depends on who you are, whether you're an employee in Santa Cruz. I was lucky when I worked here, because even though Santa Cruz has always had a big affordability gap, it wasn't as big of a gap then. So I could actually live in the downtown, walk to Palace Heart and I office supplies. So if you need New York office supplies, make sure that you shop at Palace Heart and office supplies. So whether you're an employer trying to attract employees, in Jackson Hole, the vast majority of their housing stock is owned by employees. So if you're an employee of a company, you're renting from your boss, just like the old days. So it creates a very skewed behavior between that employee and their employer. And what happens if they want to leave their job or they lose their, their home at the same time? Whether you're a first-time home buyer, again, a homeless family or person, historic preservationist, because we don't want all this growth to destroy the history and the cultural buildings that are important to us. But from our standpoint, most housing problems are economic in nature. There's fundamental underlying issues around the economics of those that create these problems. And so in that case, then we believe that most of the solutions have to be economic solutions. There's two basic problems we're trying to solve. One is affordability. Basically that a household cannot pay the cost of housing. Again, a lot of statistics in Santa Cruz around how few people, if we think of rent challenge, is anybody that's paying more than 30% of their income? You know, for housing, that's the usual standard now. The percentage of people that can't, have, can't do that in Santa Cruz is 67%. So two thirds of your renters are rent challenged. So it's an affordability issue, and then lack of investment, meaning the costs exceed what people are willing to pay. Even in the economics of Santa Cruz, we're gonna play with some examples to see, you have a low vacancy rate, relatively speaking, and most of this, when we think of our supply and demand economics 101, if you have a low vacancy rate, that seems to indicate there should be a lot of demand for housing. If there's a demand for housing, the market should be responding to provide supply for that housing. But we're not getting that to happen. There's something going on there that's interfering with our basic economic system. Generally, it's where costs exceed what people are willing to pay. So these are obviously your headlines. I've seen these headlines for a long time. Santa Cruz County needed 12,000 affordable units. These are all pretty recent. Santa Cruz having the distinction of being the least affordable city in America for teachers. Uh, and then the other one, again, the, last, the least affordable city. Consistent headlines that Santa Cruz has had for a number of years. So although many goals of housing are social, housing is market-driven, supply is determined by investors and developers, 
where capital is going, and demand is a function of what households want and are willing to pay. At some point, they can only pay so much. So what determines housing value, rental income, or sale price? One of the things we'll walk through in, the, in this workshop is to recognize that, that housing, the value of housing is not the cost to build that house. The value of that real estate is based on the income generated by it or the sale price of that home. We have vacancy rates because still in Santa Cruz you have some units that aren't occupied. So we have some discounting that happens. We're not going to collect everything. Cost of operating that, 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 um, that real estate project, you know, management, taxes, insurance, so forth. But then the cost and availability of debt. Right now, obviously, we've got probably the, the lowest cost of funds I've ever seen in my professional career. Now, sometimes that is, being, that, that is coming to play in the real estate market, sometimes it's not. Because sometimes if the cost of funds is really low, the banks actually start to adjust their underwriting criteria to kind of not let so much money get out the door. So it's not like if the Fed funds rates drops another quarter point, it's going to drive a lot of capital into these projects. So right now we have very low cost funds and it's relatively good availability, but it's still not solving the problem. So how do we respond to the market? Well, we have to know what, what households want. How much households you're willing to pay? Everybody wants to get to that 30%. And then what's the most profitable? If I'm a private developer with private money, I've got investors that are giving me money, they're going to move that money to whatever is the most profitable. And really, in that case, that, the marketplace is actually no different than we do. You know, when we're managing our 401k or our other kinds of retirement investment funds, we do the same thing with our own money. We're kind of naturally driven to how we can maximize the return on that money. I've been, I've been actively involved in opportunity zones now, which is not the topic of this conversation. But we're trying to stalk the elusive investor in opportunity zones, which is a social impact investor, that actually will take a low yield on their money. I mean, we see a lot of social impact rhetoric, but I don't see the returns that they're asking for being significantly lower than what a normal return would be. They just want the impact on top of it. So we still have a challenge of, of money that wants to go to the most profitable project and how that works in our housing. And in general, the private sector can't provide affordable, decent, safe, sanitary housing because of those cost imbalances. We have public assistance that's involved in lots of different ways, and you're playing with them within your regulatory environments now. And a lot of that is, is frankly, just a matter of the math. And we'll try and get to, again, work, work on that math tonight. So I want to talk a little bit about, one of the things I want to do in this early piece is kind of walk you through kind of the development process. One of the things that was important to me when I was going from being a frustrated planner to doing more, being more engaged in community development is I had to understand the development process. I wasn't a developer. I wasn't an architect. I wasn't a contractor. So there are a lot of pieces of the development process that I had no idea was going on. Things that were happening, other people that were involved that I didn't know about. So again, if you haven't been involved in that kind of detail, we want to give you that sense of describing the role of the investor and the lenders. That's where the money's coming from. So what do those folks tend to be? Well, the investor is a profit maximizer. Generally, they want the most amount of return on their capital given the risks. So they invest for the highest return or the economic benefits they receive. Their ROI is those economic benefits divided by how much they put into that investment, whatever it is. It could be alternative energy. I'm trying to find some investors to invest in ice making, uh, ice making machinery and the, for the cool use out on the Washington coast for their fishing industry. Whatever that investment is, we're trying to maximize investment from the investor standpoint. So low and moderate income housing, so housing that's kind of below market, 80% AMI or below, again, tends to provide marginal returns. Rents are lower because we're constraining rents, recognizing that in these projects, we're setting rents based on affordability, not necessarily based on what the market is. Vacancy and collection could be a little bit higher, depending. Again, debt could be hard to get, the terms difficult. So you might have low loan-to-values where a bank that's lending to those projects may have a lower loan-to-value 
than a higher loan to value. A lower loan to value means that that lender is nervous and is hedging their bet for not providing as much capital to that project. Or they'll have a high debt coverage and you'll get the joy of working through what these ratios mean. But a lender will protect them. Yeah? Is the debt harder to get because of those other three factors that are up there? Is that what makes the lender skittish? It's, it's, it's a combination of the two. The debt, the debt may or may not be harder to get depending on the individual circumstances, but how much they'll provide will be affected by their nervousness with the project. So I still may be able to get to a loan, but if, but if they'll only lend me 50% value, then that doesn't give me as much money as somebody else that they were going to get lend loans at 65% value. So, so it just depends, but they're, they're, inter, they're interconnected. And they'll, do, they'll only give you less because they see it as a riskier loan because of those lower rents, collection issues, right. etc. That's right. I mean, it's not, it's not acting like the marketplace. So it's unusual for them. They're not quite sure how to deal with it. If there's a, if there's a default, so again, the lender behavior, but, but if something goes wrong, they have fewer avenues to go down. And so they hedge their bets. And I found that I was working in a lot of low-income communities where, frankly, it was interesting. And you probably know this even from Seattle areas where it was easier for us to interest people who were from out of town because they would trust the numbers. If we talked to somebody locally, they would bring their bias about that area. Well, I don't care what those numbers are for that grocery store. I know that neighborhood, and I don't think it's going to work. Well, but the numbers says it should. So you get a lot of that kind of inherent bias built into the system as well. And again, you might have short amortization schedules, meaning that I'll lend it to you for a shorter period of time. I'm not sure I want to be married to you for 30 years. Maybe it's a 15-year loan. And a lot of these projects, we have little appreciation because, again, the value of real estate is based on the income. So if we constrain the income because of rent, it's not going to rise in value as much. So for a lot of people who are into real estate because they like the tax benefits that come from it, they like the appreciation, these kind of projects don't help them in that area. So it just becomes a constraint for them. Now a lender is the opposite. A lender is not a profit maximizer. Now I've been around a lot of lenders, unfortunately. And whether it's a private lender or a public lender, behavior is behavior when you're a lender. Whether it's the psychology of a person makes them go into lending, or the business of lending turns them into that personality. But they're risk limiters. Nobody wants defaults. Nobody gets rewarded in the lending world if they lose money. Even public programs. Right? If we have a loan fund, we expect the loan fund not to lose a lot of money, even if we ask it to do lots of things. We want repayment of principal at market rate of interest, but they don't want necessarily an above market rate. They just want to get their money back. Lenders are like the Eeyore of the, of the real estate world, right? I mean, they're always the well, what about, if you think of, it's almost impossible to get a yes or no decision out of a lender. It's always more of a, well, did you think about, well, let me go take that to my credit officer. Well, what about, they have a question about this. They're, because of their Eeyore is because they're always trying to worry about, are they going to get repaid? And after the recession, when we saw a lot, when we go through these cycles of lending problems that we kind of have to then correct ourselves personally, we don't want them taking a lot of risks. Because we know, at least historically, we are all the ones that then bail out the financial world when they take too much risk in these things. So, like I say, developers, again, whether they're nonprofit developers or for profit developers, they are relentlessly optimistic, typically entrepreneurial. Lenders are skeptics, so the developers are Tigger, the lenders are Eeyore. And that should tell you exactly what's going on between the two. And I was in, I'd be in meetings, and not, not before I took NEC classes, and this was exactly the case. The lenders, were, I could never figure out why they were so pessimistic. And developers were always, oh, whatever the problem is, I can take care of that. Right? There was no problem that was unsolvable, I'll get that to you tomorrow. Because you can't really be in the development business without being an optimist because you're constantly solving problems. That's, that's just what that job is. And so their business objective, you know, again, lenders is to limit risk, developers is to maximize profit. Even nonprofits I work for, they want to maximize profit on other projects. Because we expect nonprofits to do a lot of other things that they don't get paid for. So they need to be efficient with their real estate. 
And in rental housing, like most real estate, we, get, we have three basic cash financial benefits that accrue. Some of this has gotten more heightened with the Tax Reform Act and our president, but we know that we have tax benefits that come with real estate. We know that in general there's appreciation, so our real estate goes up in value. In Santa Cruz, everybody is really excited when they finally get to buy their house in Santa Cruz, because now they've kind of hit the lottery. Because at some point, when they retire, that home is going to be worth more, and it will let them go to some other place. And then there's cash flow. We expect it to be cash. Coming from our project, we expect it to go up in value, and we know that there are these tax benefits that can help us as well. So in most private projects, it's cash flow and appreciation. So I know a lot of developers that are they're going to get tax benefits, but their decision to invest capital is based on cash on cash. So what's the real cash that's going to come to me? I know I'm going to get my tax benefits, but what's the cash? And is it going to go up in value? Is it going to go up in value in a way that's going to deliver this extra benefit to me? Whereas tax benefits are the most important in low-income projects. Because, we're, again, we're constraining income. Because we're constraining income, we're constraining the appreciation value of that real estate. So if I'm going to invest in it, it's going to be because the tax benefits are important. So what are those tax benefits where there's income deferral? So you didn't know you were going to get a tax <coughs> workshop here. And then there's tax reduction. So just like your personal income tax, right? Real estate allows you to defer typically through what's called depreciation. And we're not going to get complex, but basically you get a credit for, you get a discount for the wearing out of your real estate. And you get to offset that from the income of the real estate. And so, it, and so what it does, it reduces your tax liability. So if you do personal deductions, you have a Schedule A personal deduction, you get to reduce your income with all of those deductions. So it reduces the tax you owe because it reduces your income. Now in real estate, at some point those taxes come due, when I sell the project, what I sell it for versus what, what those benefits I've gotten, you've got a capital gain. And so then you have to pay tax on capital gain, and that's why you've seen a lot of, a lot of rhetoric lately with capital gains as it relates to opportunity zones to further invest in low-income communities. Or even the president has talked about impact indexing gains to reduce the impact of that capital gain. But we get the benefit of reducing our income which reduces our taxes. And then there's also income tax reduction, so we could actually get credits. Most of us personally can't, get in, can't benefit too much from the credits themselves. But low income credits, rehab tax credits, alternative energy credits, other credits that are in the tax code, where once you determine what your taxes are, now I can take a credit and offset my taxes dollar for dollar. So you may have a, a green energy credit, you know, buying a, a, a car, on your federal taxes, and, you, and again, once you know what your taxes are, you deduct it right from there. So it has a much bigger benefit for you than, the, than just the reduction. Appreciation, we all know pretty well. We take the selling price of what is that project's value in the, in the, in the future, subtract out what it cost us, and that's the appreciation of value. We buy a home now with whatever, you know, we sell it in the future, you know, that, that difference is the appreciation. And then cash flow, that other benefit, again, we take the income of our project, all the monies that we can collect. Rent, could be parking, could be storage units that we rent, could be a laundry. I worked on a shopping, on a commercial shopping center where one of the major income streams was the money coming through the payphones. This was a long time ago. Nobody does pay phones anymore. But lots of ways in which our projects earn money. We have direct operating costs, insurance, maintenance, taxes. We may borrow money, so we got to pay whoever our lender is. So we collect our revenue, we pay our expenses. Whatever is at the bottom is our cash flow. The cash that goes into our pocket, we can then use it for anything we want to use it for. So low our income housing projects, again, tend to be weak on benefits because cash flow is restrained because we're not allowing it to be robust. Again, appreciation is doubtful. So in these projects, those tax benefits become the major source of subsidy. You know, the, the, the capital gain subsidies that we have, again, tax credits that we have, property tax issues, all kinds of other areas in which we're working on the tax issues to try and make those projects work financially.
So in housing development finance, things that we're trying to do to try and make projects work. Generally, we're trying to increase leverage, meaning that we're trying to increase how much borrowing a project can support. Because if we increase leverage, if we increase debt, we reduce equity. Remember, I'm a planner doing finance, so I try to keep things really simple, because I'm a planner. And in real estate, there's only two sources of money in a real estate project. It's either debt or it's equity. There's no other money, it's either debt or it's equity. So your cash returns, your financial returns depend on equity. All right, so if I can increase borrowing, because generally investors have a higher return requirement than a bank would want on their loan, if I can increase borrowing, then I can reduce equity and increase the return from that project. We'll play with the math to show what that does. So we can increase the owner's return. So we're looking for different kinds of lending products, or again, there may be public products that come into play to try and, again, help fill some of that gap to increase leverage. Or we can enhance security for a lender's loan. Again, we want someone else's money in. So we might fund reserves, so we provide a hedge. We can provide partial guarantees. Again, have a debt service agreement where depending on what happens, we might step in to protect them. So the lender is looking at some other help than just the project itself. So different ways in which we kind of work on the housing finance side. I'm going to go through this again relatively quickly because again, I wanted you to understand the different players and the different roles in development because I didn't know this when I started. So major actors, obviously the developer, nonprofit, for-profit, they do a lot. There's a lot of anxiety in this work, whether you're a nonprofit developer or not. So the desired benefit of market return or better. If I'm going to go through all this hassle, you know, I should at least get what my normal return is. So in all the projects I worked on from the public side, we were never looking at trying to enhance their return beyond what it would be ordinarily. It's more of how do we make sure that they get a fair return no more, no less. Because if it's less, they won't do it, because why would they? They could go do some other project that, has, that is equally frustrating and complicated and hard. So it's a fair return, but it's not a better return. Again, the appraiser that you won't necessarily see or hear about, but if you buy a home, you know the role of the appra appraiser. Third party person that establishes value. Again, the key thing here is just recognizing the appraisal process is not as much science as appraisers like to think that it is. Appraisers hate talking to people. They just like to just do their analysis and spit out numbers. If you're involved in a real estate project, make sure you talk to appraisers. Because a lot of times the appraisers are wrong. I mean, I live in Seattle. Seattle has a lot of hills. We're one of those cities with a lot of hills and valleys. So you could, if you were on a hill, but your home was worth a very different amount than if you were in a valley. And appraisers tend to work off of a two-dimensional map. So they'll draw a line around a site. They don't, they lose track of, well, now I've got a, I'm looking at a comparable that's in the valley, it's different. So the key thing with an appraiser, it's a third party, you almost never know who they are, but you're paying for them. Make sure you talk with them, figure out what they're doing, because they determine value. Lenders, by law, have to lend against that value. So it's another key actor. Then we have our lenders, hopefully they provide the bulk of financing. There are lenders who lend during construction and lenders who lend for permanent purposes once the project is operating. They could be in the same bank. So I work in the same bank for construction purposes. I'm working with the construction lending side of the bank. And then from the permanent lending side, I'm working with the permanent lenders side of the bank. They still behave in a different way because they're lending on different pieces. Right? If I'm lending on construction, I don't have income to pay my loan. All right, I have to worry about is the person going to get the project done and are they going to get at least up in a way where my permanent loan will fund to pay me off? If I'm a permanent lender, I have to worry about cash flow. Can you really do what your project projects to do? Can you get it leased up? Can you rent it at what you say you're going to rent it to? Can you operate it? But it'll be two different people with different perspectives. Again, very risk averse, desired benefit, adequate return with minimal risk. And the risks are significant, even in Santa Cruz, where you would think that everything is risk-free here because the market is so strong. But we have pre-development risks, so before a project starts to move forward for construction, there's always a risk that it will never make it to construction. And you can imagine projects around the city where it took them forever to get to construction, for lots of different reasons, some that never went to construction. Do you have a question? Yeah, I guess on the question of the risk that the developer takes, 
nonprofit or profit or low income or market rate. So you know they you know, speculate on a piece of land because a general plan says you can build X. But when they go to city council, the city council says, no, we really didn't mean that. We want less density. How does what's the repercussion on that for that situation? I mean, just, is it that simple that the deal is it's eliminated, it just won't happen? Well, it, there's lots of different things. Because obviously politics is politics. You know, and, and zoning, and, and this is one of the reasons why I'm not as much of a planner anymore. But but the reality is there's that's that's part of the reason why there's a lot of risk there, because the project may not happen. Right? You may end up finding there's environmental contamination you didn't know about. Right? Or there's or there's other things that happen. I've seen projects, I mean, one of the things we went through in Seattle is all of a sudden we had Chinook salmon named as endangered species. We eat them every Friday. But they're endangered. So every one of our land use actions had to look at its impact on salmon. And it, and it slowed down a lot of things. It's just part of the process. And the risk you have in pre-development is for lots of reasons, you may never get the ability to move forward for lots of reasons. It could be regulatory. I've had projects where the local church decided that they hated you and they brought all their people out and so you didn't get the permits. You know, the, the planning commission didn't approve it, whatever. Just lots of things that happen that are, some of our outside your control, but it means you're bearing risk that the project may never happen. Yeah. A lot of the uh, developers here look at it as if when they're figuring their timelines, that probably at least two years for litigation in the middle of everything. And so that's the money's running on, on the loans that they're stuck. And you know, there, there are projects in Scotts Valley that when I started in real estate in 1981, I talked to the original owner. It still hasn't been built. And so it's you know over almost 40 years. And there's, they still haven't figured it out. You know, that's expensive. Right. No, that, that's true. And, you know, and one of the things, I'll, I'll just because obviously there's a lot of issues that come up. I mean, in Seattle, it can take you three years to get a permit. Because you have to go through the design. Every, every place has its issues. And, and what we're going to see when we start to get to some numbers, there is a cost to that. And I think the key thing is for all of us to understand that. So, so one of my frustrations as a planner is we spend a lot of time planning but we never seem to really answer all the questions because then we, we revisit all these issues after we've done our plans. And some of that is just because of politics and we didn't really know what we thought we were gonna allow and sometimes you know, just is what it is. But, but you're right, there is a cost to it because when you're in that pre-development phase, nobody's lending on that, right? That's your cash. If you're a nonprofit, your biggest need for funding is pre-development funding because nobody will lend on that. Because it's the highest risk money, because you may never, ever right, get to construction. So there's no hope of recoupment. And Santa Cruz is ground zero for rare and endangered species. We are recognized by the UN as a hotspot for biodiversity. And it's mm -hmm. so part of the survival in climate change is right here. And we have to be careful about that. It's not just some people being arbitrary. It's right. important. No, that's right. I, I absolutely agree. That, that's why I think, to me, this is a process you should, we have to figure out. And it's a cost issue that we have to understand to see how it's impacting the cost of, of real estate, for good or for bad. I mean, it's just here's what it is, and let's just figure out how we deal with it. Yeah. Well, given the risks, what's the fair return? I'll get to that. Hold that question. Hold that, that question. Okay. Yeah. yeah um, so, what is the possibility of a jurisdiction decreasing um, the, or clarifying zoning regulations to the extent that it would actually reduce risk. Is that a path to reducing risk to clarify or stabilize zoning regulations or make them less complex, or is that kind of chasing after shadows? Well, to be honest with you, I don't. I mean, there's lots of potential answers to it, but because I stopped being a planner a long time ago, you know, I don't want to, I, I think that there's just things that we need to do to be better, to provide more clarity. I mean, I'm on a little island, Bainbridge Island, we're the size of Manhattan with 23,000 people, right? And we're fighting over our subdivisions all the time. You know, we're fighting around what our, what our land use code allows versus what our comp plan says. It, it's, this is not anything that you're unique. It's just that I, think that I think as you go forward with some of the things you want to do, you just have to figure out what, where that is, what's the expense of it, is there a reasonable way of trying to trying to provide clarity so there can be a little bit more certainty? 
If there's uncertainty, I think one of the, well, if there's uncertainty, then the return risks go higher, right? Right, because the less certain you are of your return, the higher the return's gotta be for you to put money at risk. Right, if it's more certain, your return should come down. So it's gotta be part of a conversation. I don't have any answers because I don't want to be a planner. One of the things that Santa Cruz has done that's really great in my real estate time is that the GIS printout that we get on each parcel, so that at least as a start, to, to recognize that this is in the Cyane sand hills, or this is in a flood zone, or right. this is, and so that, it, that it's, you know, that before I ever start to type, I've got some information that says, no way are we going there. Right. No, I agree with that. Last question before the board. I'm just going to make a comment. In, in comparison to the past, where you could have a project that I might be able to do 80 units on it, I have a 60. Recent legislation of the state, um, if you comply with the, the uh, general plan and the zone, you, you can get to build that, and there's density bonus that adds units, but you could not be forced down to do less units anymore. So that's more, that's taking some of the risk away, and, and if there's a contradiction between the general plan and the zoning plan, you go with the general plan first, and then whatever's left in the zoning plan applies. So it, it's, it's better for developers. And the penalty for building less is 10,000 per unit. For the jurisdiction. Yeah, for Okay. So I'll move on because I'm not a planner anymore. <laughs> so, so assuming we, we maneuver all of that, you know, your you know your Santa Cruz process, and we get to construction. Well, there's also risk at construction because we could we worry that we have insufficient funds to complete construction. When you close on financing for your project, right? So you you know you think you know what it's going to cost. You created some hedges. You got your money in line. You don't want any surprises because it's really hard to go get more money once you've started construction. Very hard to do. So you need to make sure that that construction goes well. I'll just say again, I don't do a lot of construction review. All it does say it's a different world. All kinds of things happen that are weird in that world. And there's all kinds of advantages being sought in that world. So managing construction is not an easy thing. And you worry that construction doesn't finish the job. They might have bid low. One of the things I'll tell you right now is a bid process doesn't guarantee you the lowest price. It only guarantees you a price. For the most part, with all the things going on, you almost want to be selecting contractors based on their qualifications, you know, and their competencies not based on low bid. We've seen so many projects where someone will come in and take a flyer at a price to get a contract, then the only thing they can do to make money, they either going to lose this or do change orders, then they're going to change orders, and it just gets, I'm just saying it's a, it's a really evil world. Um, or the developer goes bankrupt, because again, once you start a construction, there's no new money coming in. The developer has to have the resources to carry it to get it done. But we've seen a lot of developers go bankrupt at very time, so you don't have money there. So you might have a project that sits unbuilt for a long time, or construction stops, or you'll see the project where construction all of a sudden goes really slow because now their cash flow is tight, so they're trying to kind of squeeze this thing out. All of it during that construction phase where you have money at risk, construction lending is typically more expensive than permanent lending, and you got to get to the finish line. And then the stages that they're going through, again, I'm just, I'm just going to show you these. They're in the book. And again, this is just to kind of, again, re recognize that development business is, is, is tough. Creating that concept, testing the marketplace, who's willing to pay, what they're willing to pay for, the unit mix, the size of the units, all of those you know, feed into the, the development uh, program that's going to lead to the costs. They're determining financial feasibility, evaluating the site, does it have some issue on it they didn't think about? How much is it going to cost to build? What contractor are they going to use? And then constructing their pro forma, an income and expense statement. So in the, again, keeping real estate simple, there's only two documents you have to worry about in real estate. Regardless of what somebody calls it, there's a development budget. So there's somewhere there that's, a, that's a, an assemblage of all of the costs it's going to take to make this thing happen. Development budget, it can be called different things. And then there's an operating pro forma. You can have, you can have financial summaries that are multiple pages. But at the end of the day, there's a development budget with the sources and uses, source of funds that balance your use of funds, and there's a pro forma, which is the income side of the project. Now it's constructed. Now we're operating. We've leased it up. Now how does it perform financially? 
How do we project our income sources and rent rates? Projected vacancy rates and expenses for that project. Remember, you're projecting if it takes you two years, what construction could be 18 months to, to 24 months in Santa Cruz. So you're projecting two years from now. What's it going to look like two years from now? Did I hit the mark on rents? Did I hit the mark on expenses? Is there some other cost that came along in the meantime I didn't know about? No, that affects my pro forma. But in a real estate project, there's either there's a budget and an operating pro forma. And this is what a pro forma will look like in a simple way. So there's lots of complexity to real estate. When we start to play with Excel spreadsheets, we can bring a lot of detail to it. Some of that's good and some of that, again, keeps it mysterious for us. But at the end of the day, the pro forma has gross rent. So what's the income that we're going to collect from our rental units, assuming 100% occupancy? Do we have other income? Again, parking, storage sheds, other ways in which the renters pay something, but it's not rent. It's money they pay in some other way. We know we're not going to collect everything. There's going to be some hedge. So what's that hedge? 5%, 7.5%, what's common in the marketplace? to get to effective gross rent, which is really now we figure out what we really think this project's going to do. Right? We've got all, we, we, we know we're not going to get everything, so we've hedged. Now this is what we really think we can plan on. Then we, then we start to go for our operating expenses. Again, taxes, maintenance, insurance, utilities, management fees, replacement reserves. Some I've seen in most, most affordable housing products have a fairly robust amount of reserves that are held there. In some private projects, I don't see as much reserves. It just depends on access to funding. Take our effective gross minus operating expenses. That gets us to NOI, net operating income. The most important number in real estate. It almost should be whispered now. Because it's, it's at NOI that you know whether you have a real estate project. If you don't have revenues exceeding expenses, you don't have a project. Right? When the tax code was fixed under Ronald Reagan way back when, it changed the rules. We had a lot of real estate that was built solely to lose money to shelter income. After that, in 1986, and it's still confirmed now, any investment has to be intended to make money. So if you don't have revenues exceeding expenses, you don't have a project. It's that important. When we get to NOI, now we can determine how much will a bank lend to us. Once we get to NOI, we can figure out what will the market value our real estate for. That again helps us with determining its value and what a bank will lend to us. So how do we do that? Well, calculating rents is pretty simple math. Again, I'm a planner, so this is all simple for me. You don't have to do anything that your phone calculator, you know, you don't need an Excel, you don't need uh, a 17B, though I have one here. So how do we compute our rents? Obviously our rents are the number of units we have times the rent for that unit times 12. You know, rents are typically, in residential, rents are typically quoted as a monthly number. So if I have a studio, I'm charging the studio 500 a month for each month for 12 months. So I'm always annualizing. Oh, shit. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Um, if, if we're in commercial space, again, commercial typically is quoted annually. So you just have to know the convention. We're always trying to annualize things. This is, this is an example of a cash flow from a project I'm working on. And you can see all the, ink, the escalators, residential income, affordable rental income, that's market rate. You can see other income that's being generated that's parking and other things. Then you can see the, all the operating expenses there getting to NOI. Down at the bottom. $2.76 million. So it can be as detailed as you want it to be, or you can simplify it. We prepare our sources and uses for funds for construction and permanent. So what are all the costs that must be funded? So your development budget really has to cover everything. So it's a, surprising to me how many people will miss some things in their development budget. Even to the point, you know, with projects I've been involved with where we even itemize wire transfers. When we do our construction loan, the bank's going to wire funds. They're going to charge us 500 bucks to do that wire every month or whatever it is. So we're going to budget that. Some banks I've seen actually require us to do a title report for every draw that we do because they want to make sure that nobody's leaned the property before, you know, ahead of that draw. So a title report that could cost us 500 bucks. 
So the development budget has to include everything because you don't want to be surprised. And then you're identifying what funding sources will be available to cover these costs. It's either debt or it's equity. So here's a development budget. You can see all the categories on the left-hand side. Some of those costs are incurred during construction. And some of those costs are incurred after construction. So we might have things like a developer fee, rent up reserves that are paid after construction is done. So I don't need my construction loan to necessarily cover those things. The development fee is usually the last cost that's provided. So the developer fee is really a contingency. You want a developer fee in a budget, but the developer fee is really an additional contingency. It's usually only paid if there's money remaining at the end of construction. But there's different time frames in which those dollars are incurred so you, can, so you can make your lending accordingly. And again, then you've got to secure financing. Again, you obtain a permanent loan commitment. What's ironic in the financing world is you don't get a construction loan first, you get a permanent loan first. Because the construction lender is really going to get paid by the permanent lender. Right? So the permanent lender needs to review your pro forma and determine how much they'll lend, how much they trust your operating assumptions. And then once you have that permanent loan commitment, now you can have a more meaningful conversation with your construction lender. You'll be talking to them, but they're just not going to make any commitments. They're not the first ones to commit, even though they're the first money that's being used in the project. Yeah. So just a reality check based on our earlier discussion. Those permanent lenders realize that this thing may be a decade away, but they're still willing to say, yes, I will lend to you at that 10 years out on the, and you can use that guarantee to get your construction loan? Well, I think you're being facetious saying 10 years out. Well, well, I'm gonna, years out. well so, so a permanent lender will make a, a forward commitment, right? They'll have conditions. So they'll talk about pre-leasing that has to be done before their loan will close. So they'll have conditions for their loan. They'll talk about their rate, and it may be a rate that's, that's, that's indexed to something because nobody knows what that rate will really be. But they'll, but they'll provide you know, a letter of intent you know, or a soft commitment depending on how close you are to your project being done. You can get that. So but they're actually going to, so you're saying this is the loan you get first, but the construction loan is the one you're actually gonna use. So does this loan, do they actually give you their $50 million? No, 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 no. I mean, they're giving you a commitment. So, so you would end up executing documents, you know, that where they're committing, and, and their commitment letter will provide those specific conditions subject to funding. And you use their letter to get Their letter is what the construction lender is going to use to determine what they're, how they're going to lend to you. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, then you develop, you prepare the final drawings, submit proposals, oversee construction, not an easy thing. And then you operate it. Again, not an easy thing. Because you have to make sure this property works well, you have to lease it up. Right? So circumstances may change, and lease up is slower. I mean, your permanent lender is going to have lease up requirements. So if your lease up goes slower, we thought we would have all our units occupied in six months. But it took us 12. So that means your permanent loan stayed out for those 12 months. Your construction lender was carrying that, which means you're paying more interest on the construction loan. Right? So it's the lease up, it's then the operations, are you being efficient? You know, again, managing the real estate. Again, not an easy thing to do. So again, going back to our pro forma, we got to NOI. We add our debt, subtract our debt service. How much will our lender provide to the project? And then we get the cash flow, you know, what happens with what, what goes into our pocket at the end of the day. And really that same summary is in the forms here on the desk. So what you have on the desk is a simple pro forma and you have a development budget. It's a different version, but exactly the same contents and the same things. So this is an example. I've got my NOI. Up in Seattle, we have an, a tax abatement program for housing. So I've got my NOI there, I've got my asset management fees, then I've got my financing. In this case, we're borrowing $40 million. I've got the rate terms on that. Uh, then you can see my cash flow after debt service down here. And then of that cash flow, we're splitting it between the nonprofit partner and a private investor that's investing money. 
So exact same criteria, a little bit more complexity because the project's more complex, but same concepts. So how do we estimate what the bank is going to lend to us? Well, again, this is NDC. We're doing old school. You don't need a fancy calculator. Well, in the old days, you'd have what was called a loan constant, which is the weighted term and interest cost of a loan. So a bank's going to provide an amortizing loan, amortizing meaning like your home mortgage. You make one payment. That payment includes principal and interest. So it's the same every month. At the end of the 30 years, now it's paid off in full. No, you get the deed back. So they can provide a loan constant. So if we want to estimate debt service, then that's the loan amount that the bank is, that we're hoping to get times that constant. And we can determine that constant by looking at our book. Because nobody knows mortgage constants anymore. We actually had a guy on our board that does a lot of real estate that still has a constant table that he uses. But if you go to page 36, because we want you to be able to do this, but not have to worry about your financial calculator or Excel. So constant chart. So all you're doing is you're looking at what's the bank's loan term and rate. So, so if I want to get a mortgage in Santa Cruz today, I would probably I would be able to get a 30-year mortgage, right? So what would be the rate that I probably would get? Is it about four or below four? Four and a half percent. So four and a half percent. So if I go to year 30, page 30, and I go down to 4%, four percent, four and a half percent. So I see a constant of 0 0.0609. So, so that's, the, that's the mortgage constant. So I would take the loan amount, a million dollars, right? That's what it costs to buy a house in, in Santa Cruz nowadays. I've heard of that. It's a lot more than I Take that million dollars times 0 0.0609, that's your annual debt service. So even though the interest rate is 4.5%, the mortgage constant is 0 0.0609, or 6%, because it's factoring in the principal portion of your payment. So the constant is doing both principal and interest. But for our purposes, the simple thing is, what are we borrowing? What's the bank term? We go to get that loan constant. Loan amount times constant equals debt service. So that is one. Now, the reason why I like real estate is that finance is, this is an algebraic formula. Right, three variable algebraic formula. I crushed algebra. <laughs> Calculus crushed me, but algebra I can get. Three variables, you have to know two variables, solve for the third. So you can check your math, you can go back through, am I right? Oh, I'm right, okay. So three variables. So if I want to figure out the debt service, I have to know the loan amount. The loan constant comes from the bank's rate and term. Right now, now because it's algebraic, I might move those numbers around. I may want to figure out how much loan can I get, right? I mean, it's an algebraic formula, so I'd have to know the debt service, and I'd have to know the constant, right? But if I wanted to do that, so if we went through the, you know, do this, and then cross through and cross out, that's the formula that we get, because it's algebra, which is great. Um, so that's how we determine the debt service. So if we're going through our pro forma, revenues, vacancy, expenses, NOI, what's the bank going to lend to us? Loan amount times constant gives us debt service. Or if we know what the debt service is, we know what the bank's terms are, divided by that loan, that mortgage constant, tells us how much the bank will lend to us. So we can, so the bank will tell us how much the debt service will be, or we can tell the bank what we think they'll lend to us. Go either way with it. But it's algebra. So on our spreadsheet, you know, now, we can, now we can go down and add our debt service. So this is actually cash flow after tax. We're not going to worry about that because that's after tax and we don't want to get through taxes today. So key things in measures. So how do you determine whether you're going to put your money at play? Well, there's, there's rates of return that you're going to, you're going to depend on. The first one, as I talked about, for most developers, it's cash on cash, which is cash flow divided by cash equity. Literally, cash on cash, because finance is so sophisticated. So how much do you get, and how much did you have to put in? That's a cash on cash return. And that's really the fundamental 
return that we see from the decision box. So again, that's an algebraic formula, right? Cash flow divided by cash equity. So you control your pro forma, you control what cash flow is, right? I want to show an investor what return I can give that investor, so I have to know how much equity they're going to put in. But sometimes I may not know how much equity they'll put in. So I want to solve for equity, but if I'm solving for equity, I have to know the other two. What would be the normal return in the marketplace? If I know that and I control cash flow, then then I can determine how much equity I can expect to see in this project. So the key thing with, with, with finance with these algebraic formulas is you don't always get the you don't always get the you're not always solving for the answer that you need. But you can use the, the formulas to be able to you know, manipulate them in an algebraic way to get the answer that you need. So I may know what their equity is, and I can give them a return. Or if I know what their return expectations are, I can tell them how much equity they should put in the project. So different returns, again, this is the key one. You'll also hear IRR, or internal rate of return which is basically more complicated algebra, but it's recognizing that your real estate is providing return every year. Right? Each year you're providing cash flow. So each year it kind of has a different return to it. So how do I figure out what the real return is for my project? Well, I can do what's called a present value of those returns over time. More complicated math. You would need more than just your phone calculator. But that's what IRR is. It's taking into account that the dollar I'm getting five years from now is not the same as the dollar I get today. I'm discounting it back. So the math is more complicated, but again, I don't, I don't see a lot of people make decisions based on IRR. I mean, you run your performer, you can run an IRR out as long as you want, but main, the main decisions are cash on cash, because that's much more immediate and much, more, much, more, much closer. So now, back to your question about returns. So I pulled this out of the Wall Street Journal. Handy two, it was two weeks ago. So different yields. Cash flow yield from real estate is the same as yields coming from other kinds of investment that I could put my money to. So the thing that's interesting to me is, oh, so if I'm in the S&P 500, Wall, so I'm on Wall Street, I'm in the market. Over that period of time, the, the market obviously has gone up and down a lot this year. Right? It's been soaring, it's been collapsing, it's been soaring. Average yield, 2% over that time frame. You know, high-grade municipal bonds, 4%, and so forth. So, so when you look at where other money is, so if I can go into, you know, right today, a 10-year Treasury, U.S. Treasury, uh, about a, it's about 1.75%. So if I trust the federal government for 10 years, I get 1.75%. If I put it in Wall Street, I get 2%. So what is my level of, of risk, and what am I prepared to put my money at risk for? So there's no real answer. I mean, I've seen anywhere from, um, nowadays I've seen yields as low as 4 or 5% cash on cash returns. I've seen them as high as 18%. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the reality is, because again, it takes a while to get into the details of, of the real distributions. But there's a whole gamut, there's no one answer. It just depends. If there's a lot of investor cash out there, there's more competition, the rates are going to go down. What I've seen in the West Coast, because none of us in the West Coast have been able to control our construction costs. You know, our markets are stabilizing. Rents aren't necessarily soaring, but our costs are still high. So something has to give if you're gonna develop real estate, yields are coming down. So now I'm seeing investor yields that are at five to 6% that we can get in Seattle, I think it could get those in the Bay Area because of that. But the real answer is it, it depends. You know, it depends on what your project does, where I could put money elsewhere and how I perceive those risks of me getting my money back. And then the last measure that we're trying, we're gonna go over this and then we're gonna let you actually kind of get to some, some fun with the cases is the overall return in real estate or what we call a capitalization rate, which basically reflects the overall cash return on real estate. 
So when, when you look at what, the, the key thing here is if, if, I'm out in, if I'm looking at what buildings are selling for in Santa Cruz. So a, a building is being sold. I can look at, well, what income is that building generating? What price did somebody pay for it? And I can determine what's the rate of return they, they require to make that transaction happen. And I can look at different transactions in the area to figure out if there's a pattern. What are investors doing in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County? What are investors doing in a commercial project versus a residential project? I mean, different investors will look for different product types. But you can look at transactions that are going on in the marketplace to figure out what are they, how are they valuing capital? The key thing with a cap rate is the uh, is that we're using cap rates to value real estate. And we're using it basically to estimate based on what investors are buying existing cash. Right? So it's an existing building with proven cash flow. So it's proven cash flows, their, their reform, real yield requirements should be lower than normal because it's real cash. It's not, they're not speculation that it won't get built or speculation that it won't appreciate in value. So it tends to be at the lower end, so you would never use a cap rate to say, well, that's an investor's return requirement. Because it's not, it's just what investors are paying for cash. So usually you could go into a, the appraisal markets, you will buy any real estate service, will help you figure out what cap rates are. They're different everywhere. You know, they're different in growing markets, they're different in soft markets, they're different in residential versus commercial, and they change over time. If people are concerned about the future, their cap rate will go up, because they're more, they're more concerned, so they're cautious. If you're cautious, your rate goes up. If they think the market's gonna do fine, then their rate goes down because they have a high confidence. Changes all the time. Changes by region, changes by product type. Okay. So I am going, I'm not gonna do this. I just wanna do this. What I have to do is get this so I can bring the case. Um, so we wanna talk about loans and how do we determine what the lender will lend. Again, the permanent loan is that long-term financing. Again, it's where the, the project is operating. So until it gets to what we call stabilization or operating the way we think it's gonna operate in the marketplace, it's kind of in the construction phase at that point. And then it's hit stabilization, now it's operating. So we have a lender that's gonna provide financing usually for 15 to 40 years, depending on the project. Again, they're gonna get repaid from that rental income. So they have to believe in that rental income. And then we have the construction lender, again, that short-term financing, again, repaid from permanent financing sources. So the permanent lender is gonna have some ratios. So if, you, if you've gone through a home mortgage purchase, this is exactly the same concept. Investors are gonna be careful. I mean, lenders are gonna be careful. Remember, they're EOR. They wanna make sure that you always have a dollar to pay them on, on the mortgage that you owe them. So they're not gonna let you you know, borrow that meet, that maxes out your income. They're going to hedge their bets. And they're going to do it a couple of different ways. You know, what's called debt cover ratio or debt service cover, which again is the your NOI divided by debt service. So it represents the first the first way out for a lender. You know, it's the cash that pays the loan. So if the debt cover is high, so if in this case a 1.2, fairly typical. So 1.2 means I have a dollar twenty of NOI for every dollar of debt. So I've got 20 cents or 20% as a cushion. Right? The bank's not gonna let me you know, use the, 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 the 120, they're gonna only let me use the dollar. So they're creating a hedge, they're making sure that I make money. If there's a low debt cover, that means confidence. If I'm doing a, if I'm doing a, a high tech, a low income housing project with bonds, I probably can go out 40 years or 45 years. I probably can get a 1.1 debt cover on that because those projects are less economically risky. So depending on the lender issues out there, oh, when I get an FHA mortgage, I get an FHA guarantee on it. Then I might see 1.1 or 1.15, and Seattle, we're getting 1.1. because a bit tougher on affordable housing now. If I'm a hotel, I might be at 1.6, because hotels are risky. So that debt cover, if it's low, the lender is saying they're confident in this. If it's high, then they're saying they're not very confident, so they're not calling as much money. Now again, I'm, not, I'm gonna put these up on the wall while we're working, but remember that's an algebraic formula, right? The power of algebra. So if, if we wanna figure out the debt cover, 
you know, then we look at our NOI and we have to know the debt service. But if we're trying to figure out the debt service that the bank loan will, 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 will be required of us, we can do that algebra differently and that NOI divided by the debt, per, debt cover will tell us how much loan payment the bank will make us do. I'll do that algebra while you're working on the case. But remember, it's an algebraic formula. In this case, we're solving for debt cover. But in most cases, the bank will tell you these. You can walk into any bank. They'll make you get, tell them who you are and where you live and why you're asking for this information. But they will give you their underwriting criteria. What's the debt cover and what's the loan to value that we require? Because that's the other one. It represents their second way out. It's collateral risk. So how much the loan amount divided by that fair market value? So once I value my real estate, the bank will loan against it. We think of home loans as like an 80% of value, 90% of value. Again, that's the bank lending against that value. The higher the loan to value, the higher, the higher confidence they have that you're going to be OK. And it represents their second way out. Because if they have to take back the real estate and sell it, they're not going to get the best price for it. right? Because that's all those webinars, seminars that you guys stay up late at night watching. You know, how to get rich in the real estate industry is going to the courthouse steps and getting all these distressed properties at cents on the dollar. The banks know they're not going to get the best prices. So they're hedging their bets. Usually we see between 75 and 80 percent. Sometimes we'll see them lower. I see a lot of things around here that are at 60, 65 percent. You know, hotels, again, they're down at 40 to 50 percent. So if I'm not sure how this is going to work, my loan to value goes down. If I'm confident, my loan to value goes up. So the bank will lend more against that value. Okay. So there's my example. Lender is offering 7% 25-year loan. Developer wants a million one from the, from the borrower. Here's my pro forma through NOI. So I have $100,000 of NOI. And I want a million one from the bank. Will I get it? Well. In the first case, debt service equals loan amount times constant. So a million one from the bank. This is the loan constant from the bank's terms, right? The terms of 7% at 25 years. That's the constant. So there's my debt service, 93,000. 100,000 of NOI divided by 93,000 of debt service is 1.07. Now the bank's like, nah, my debt cover is 1.2. 1.07 is not going to do it for me. Okay, well now we know the lender's debt cover, algebraic formula, right? You know two variables, you can solve for the third. So that 100,000 of NOI divided by that debt cover equals 83,000. So 83,000 is what the bank will let us use for that loan. And then that debt service divided by the loan constant, algebraic formula, let's just figure out the loan amount. So we wanted a million one, Based on debt cover, the bank is going to lend us 981. So we may have wanted something, but the bank's ratios are going to tell us what the bank will lend. And the same thing on, on market value. So our $100,000 divided by the cap rate gives us a value of 1,176. So a million one of a loan with a value of 1,176 is 94% loan to value. Bank's not going to do that. The bank wants 80% loan to value. So again, we just do the do the, the algebraic formula in another way. We've got value of a million one seventy-six times 80% is 941. So the bank is going to have typically a bank will have two ratios. I've seen key bank is one bank. You don't have key bank down here that tends to focus on debt cover as a lending criteria. But most banks have both ratios. So you have to meet both ratios. If they say you've got to meet both ratios, you've got to meet both ratios. So based on debt cover, the bank would lend 981. Based on loan to value, they'd lend 941. The only loan that meets both ratios is the lower of the two. So we came in wanting a million one. The bank is going to lend 941. So now we have $150,000 of equity that we have to find. All right, so that's on our nut because the bank isn't going to lend anymore and recognize the bank's lending criteria had nothing to do with cost. Cost is what cost is. The bank is going to lend based on value of the real estate, which is determined by the operating performer. There's really no connection between the operating performer and the development budget. So it's not like if, I, if, I, if it costs me a million dollars, the bank will give me a million dollars. The bank will lend me money based on what my operating performance is. 
and the value of the real estate. The two are not connected in that way. Yeah. But to ascertain a certain rent from a, uh, a loan from a bank, you might have to increase your rents to fall so the bank would uh, provide you the loan. Well, I mean, you may, the, you may not like what the bank's loan number is. And if, if your market can support higher rents, then, then obviously you could do your adjusting however you want to do your adjusting. Right, so it's not that the developers uh, a greedy, whatever. It's oh, no, 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 they're, they're always greedy. Alone. They're always greedy. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. I mean, the point is that, that the developer doesn't have all the cards in this game either. Right? They have a market that will only pay a certain amount. So they got a lender that's got criteria that aren't always favorable. And, and so you're right, at a certain point, and we're, we'll show in the examples, where at a certain point, this is just what it costs. You know? And this is what it is, and we may not like the impact of it, but this is what it is. So, now we, so once we know what it is, then we can try and solve that. And we can try and work on those solutions. But you're right, at the end of the day, you may need a certain amount. Uh, from the bank and from because your equity investor needs a certain return that, so you need money from the bank or you've got a gap you can't you can't you don't have sources to equal uses and so you're looking to increase your rent if you can because that increases the value so that increases what the bank will provide okay. yeah 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 so is there a way, what about um, government intervention to change the risks that banks face without actually themselves putting money in is that a, an impossible strategy? Well, it, it depends. I mean, again, we're, you know, the, the idea here is what's conventional. So I've seen uh, public sector that will provide a loan guarantee. I've provided a debt service guarantee. So I want, I want the bank to put more money in. So if I know what the bank's ratio is in, then I'll guarantee the difference mm -hmm. of what the bank believes it will be versus what I'm prepared to risk. There's lots of ways the public could intervene if it chooses to. But I think the key thing for what we want to do here is figure out the problem, and then kind of the next seminar would be, oh, okay, once we know the problem, let's figure out ways in which we can try and solve it. Recognizing that no one has solved the problem. All of your peer communities around the country have exactly the same problems. And there's, there's not a lot of solutions, you know, without just throwing, without money. I mean, money's obviously a solution. So let's get to a case, because I want you to play around with the numbers. So in your case book, and this is just simple math, so don't worry about it. Again, you can use, you can use your, your telephone. But if you turn to page 33, Frostbite Falls. I know you all were once will recognize Frostbite Falls. And that's a euphemism for a real community in upstate Minnesota. And I'm not going to go into the, to, to narrating it, but the key thing, this is, this is to me, is very analogous to Santa Cruz. Upstate Minnesota, they're trying to recruit companies to come there. Rural community, they've got a, a, a snowmobile company that's looking at locating there. Just their market, that there's also a cost structure that's advantageous, so they want to relocate a plant there. But the worry they have is housing costs. They're not sure that their employees can, can be housed there. They have some employees that will come, and some will come from the local community. But the vacancy rate in the community is 2%, so there's not a lot of units. And they're not getting the units built. So the company's concerned, and what the company has said is, you have, to, you have to show us how housing can get created for us to invest in moving this plant here. So you have an economic development strategy which, whose solution is affordable housing, or they're not going to come. So in, so in Frostbite Falls, you can see a nice little description, it's a real project. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> Next page 34, you can see the development costs. So we've given you the development budget. So if you want to use your worksheets and stuff, that's all fine. We've given you your operating costs. Right? So we're giving you a lot of pieces of this case. But the first order of business is to figure out what Wally meant when he said the rental housing doesn't pencil out. So in Santa Cruz, if you talk to the private developer, they might say the, the, the projects just don't pencil, meaning that they, the math doesn't work for them. Well, how can that be? We've got 2% vacancy. Surely there's a demand here to make it work. Let's figure out what that means. So your assignment is going to be assignment one. Prepare an operating pro forma. So in that worksheet, you're going you're gonna to prepare the operating pro forma just for year one. That's all it is, is year one. Do NOI, assume rents of $1,050 per month per unit, 
a 5% vacancy rate. You already have expenses here. So what's the NOI? So you're going to project rent. We've given you the vacancy. We've given you expenses. So you're just going to do the simple math. Then question two, what would the debt service be on a million three? So the bank is going to lend a million three. So you don't have to determine what the bank will loan. We've told it for you. 7% for 20 years. Short term, high rate, the bank is, is worried. So you're going to get the mortgage constant for a 20 year mortgage of 7%. Loan amount times loan constant is debt service. So you, you've got the NOI, now you can figure out debt service. So you get the cash flow. So what's the cash flow the project generates? And once you know the cash flow, what's the cash on cash return for Wallet? And you know that because the project's going to cost X, whatever is not debt is equity. Very simple. But whatever the bank isn't going to lend is equity to the project. Once you know the equity to the project, cash on cash. Cash flow divided by cash equity tells you what the return is. What's the return I can give to an investor on this project? And then we'll see whether that's enough to make this project work. Okay? So just work through that math with the worksheet there. So you have to determine your revenue. We've given you vacancy. We've given you expenses. You have to determine the debt service. Get the cash flow. What's equity? What's the cash flow divided by cash equity? supposed to put in the uh, rent for the uh, site for the, for the business? No, no, no. Okay. The business is going to go wherever okay. the business is. Okay. But they need the housing built for them to feel comfortable bringing the plant there. Okay? So that's what you're going to work on. We'll re regroup in about, uh, about seven minutes.
And then this total development cost is 2.625 thousand, 2.625 million rather. Uh, the bank is one of the Lemmy 1275. So that leaves equity of, um, no, excuse me, the bank is lending 1350,000. So the, it leaves me an equity of 1275,000. So my 31,000 a year of cash divided by that 1275 million I've got to put in comes to about 2.4% return for Did anybody else get a number that was wildly different than the Jews? Yeah, yeah. you're not putting your money in that. It's close to the people. Right. Yeah, that's okay. what we're seeing. So you have experts even within the community itself. So obviously the key it doesn't pencil because rents aren't high enough, costs are what they are. We still only we, we, we the bank will only lend so much. So we get a 2.4 percent return. Would we do that? Probably not. Right? It's just too low. I can I can go into the I can go get a beautiful bond. From the city of Santa Cruz, that would pay more than that without me having to worry about it. Mm -hmm. So that's the real key: is in, in, in real estate financing, you've got debt and equity, and we're always trying to figure out how to attract equity. Most of the equity people, none of us will ever meet. Those are people, you know, that aren't in circles that I've worked in, but they they have the financial resources and they have return requirements. And if we and if we're not acknowledging those, then they're just not going to you know play in our game. Now again, I've seen in some communities where those yields are coming down a bit, but recognizing the developer doesn't the developer doesn't have a lot of choices. You know, their investors that they typically work at work with look for certain kinds of yields. If you don't have it, they're not going to invest. They got other places they can move their money. You yourself wouldn't invest in it. Right? So it's not just the developer being you know, evil, you know, kind of money grabbing. It's not even good enough. So bringing it into our bigger concept text of our community and right. with this case study, is this where the public sector steps in and says, look, there's a social value to us to attract your company here. So we're going to look to offer you some other incentives within our community. Um, you know, rebates on this or reduction of developer fees, whatever it is, maybe to reduce his equity so that, yeah, he Typically, we'd only get 2.4%, but maybe that number can bump up, and that's where you have some negotiation with this potential employer and developer to see yeah, how well, we now, now, if we really want this, now, now we have to put our shoulders to the wheel and figure this out, right? So, so if we had gone through this case through all of its permutations, which we didn't because we don't have time, but our, our next step was can we find a lender that will be more generous? 20 years at 7%, that seems pretty cautious. So we go, we go to another bank, a bank is going to provide a 30 year loan. Uh, so we can increase the debt for this project, reduce the, if we reduce the equity, maybe we get a yield, but then it's sufficient. When we do the math, it's not sufficient either. Uh, so we still got a problem. I mean, the end, the eventual solution was you have to look outside the economics of the project. So, so this, the community actually solved the problem with doing its own financing, because it could finance longer term at a better rate than 7% for the bank. And they, and they did something with their taxes. And so they so they reduce taxes in a way that allowed incomes to be higher, allowed the value for the project to be higher. So when we talk about in Seattle and Washington State, we don't have tax tax increment financing. We've never had tax increment financing. We have tax abatement. So if we're doing affordable housing, we can pay taxes for for 12 years. And in Seattle, our property taxes are pretty high. Because Washington State doesn't have an income tax. So we collect our revenue through a high sales tax, 10.1%, and through a high property tax. A lot of that property tax is actually voter approved tax now. So we waive that. And so they don't pay those taxes. That increases NOI. If you increase NOI, you increase value. If we increase value, we increase how much the bank will lend. So once you know what your problem is, it is now you can focus on that problem. You still may not solve it. Again, sometimes we're seeing now, again, on the West Coast, our costs are just so challenging to control. The gap is just enormous. So at some point, city of Seattle, we had a levy for $350 million of housing money. Santa Clara County voted $800 million of housing resources. How much? 950. Other cities are doing the same thing. They're just they're bringing money to the, to the equation because at some point, that's just what you've got to do. Yeah. Santa Cruz, a good portion of our tax, it 
revenue comes from the tenant occupancy tax. The people that work in the tourist industry are probably some of the lowest paid people here. Mm -hmm. It seems to me it would make sense to take some of that tenant occupancy tax and provide suitable housing close to where the tourists are showing up so that we, we have people can afford to continue to work in the tourist industry and have housing. You know, we are our, our blocks on the freeways, it's what it costs to widen the freeway. If people were living closer, they would they would they would have something, you know, that, that we that thinking in terms of the whole system and where where our source of revenue is, I think is at least something that's worth exploring. Well, to me, the key is obviously we're not going to solve that problem tonight. But you have to look at everything. I mean, in, in Seattle right now, we are looking at significant amounts of corporate investment, investing in, a, in workforce housing. I mean, so like a lot of places, we have subsidies that allow low-income housing. The private market will take care of itself. But there's nothing in the middle for our teachers or firemen or whatever. So, so we're now working with the corporate community Amazon, who, who we like and hate at the same time. Uh, now Salesforce is up there with Mark Benioff, we've got Microsoft, that's just, in debt, they're investing $500 million in housing solutions. So we're trying to bring a different source of capital to help fill that gap. Will we solve the problem? We don't know yet, because we're still trying to move all the pieces together. But it has to be a comprehensive, it has to be comprehensive and it has to involve all sectors of the community. Everyone has to be engaged in the solutions because it can't come from any one thing. It can't come just from the banking world. It can't come from we need investors to take a lower yield. I mean, that's just not going to be productive. Okay, a couple of quick questions, and I want to get to what the, the, the grand finale. So what is the incentive for, um, for these corporations to want to invest in housing? They want their employees to. Employees? Some of it is, is kind of civic well-being. But part of it is they don't want, I mean, just like you said, we have people now in Seattle, when I moved up to Seattle, <coughs> California, we always reference, you know, commute times by time, right? I'm 20 minutes away, I'm 30 minutes away. We never thought in terms of miles. I mean, in Seattle, the city of Tacoma is maybe 30 miles away from the city of, Tac of Seattle. The city of Tacoma, we would never ever go to for a movie. But in California, you would do that in a heartbeat because of how we think of time. So we now have people commuting over two and a half to three hours, those super commutes that the Bay Area has now. We had those in the Puget Sound now, we've never had those before because people are being driven out because of affordability. So, so we've got those same issues, we've got congestion in some places, people are driving out, and that's why it's gotta be a regional solution. But like I said, I mean, the good news is that not any, nobody solved it. So it's not like Santa Cruz is further ahead or further behind. This is just a really hard problem. Yeah. Give me an example. It said five thousand dollars for permits for a twenty-unit like development. Mm -hmm. Is that like a normal thing? Because that's like nowhere close to reality. It's minimum. It's minimum. Well, yeah. Recognize that everyone's different, but but I will say cities compete with each other by how <laughs> lenient they're going to be on stuff. Now, for the most part, that doesn't mean that a company wants to, a companies don't always go to the cheapest place, right? We're all proof of that, right? Our, our economies are growing, and we're some of the most expensive places in the country because of the dynamic now between the, the workforce and the quality of the workforce and where companies have to go to access that workforce. And so they're not necessarily looking for the cheapest places. Uh, but, but clearly, the public looking at the, the cost they bring to a project as part of a solution to gaps is all, all those things have to be on the table. Yeah, Bonnie? Yeah, I did, just to that, that question, I did want to point out that for affordable housing projects, developers by right have the ability to ask the city to waive or defer uh, some of the relevant permit fees for affordable housing projects. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the solutions that we have already embedded into um, our way. We already do that. It's up to council ultimately to grant that, and we'll take that to council. But that is something that they, by right, can ask for if they're providing affordable housing. Okay. So let's so let's end the. So remember, we talked about this was just a 101, and what we if if you're interested, we can have a continuing discussion to start to get into more detail, more technical, more technique oriented of how we try and engage. So what we wanted to try and do is to figure out what's a Seattle. I'm sorry, I'm I'm on Seattle time. What's a Santa Cruz prototype? 
So, so what I did is, um, and, I, and I need all of your help because you know your community better than I do, even though I was here for a while. I, I rummaged around a bunch of documents. And so we tried to come up with what would be at least a generic market rate project in Santa Cruz so we could play with this map. Right, so what, so what we want to do is, so this is my budget, and again, this is just me rummaging around. So what, I don't do it bigger, the, oh, but we'll have to scroll down more. Um, so if, and then the idea is if once, once we won't leave here, so we've got 20 minutes, so we want to create, okay, what's, what do we agree on as the prototypical project? Do these numbers make sense based on your experiences? So we have an, an example here that's in the realm of possibility. And then, at some point, let's figure out, let's, now, let's, now we've got real numbers, let's figure out if we can solve the problem. So this is a generic project I pulled together, you know, property size of 48,400. Um, which may or may not make sense. It's one acre, right? Yeah, a little bit over an acre. Uh, 32 units, so not, not massively dense. Again, this is just all illustrative. So, so here, so I've got you know debt coming of 15 million, which you'll see where I got the debt from. So I need equity of 8 million. But the way this was, the way the costs were, so this is the development budget. So I've got site acquisition, my 48,000. I'm pricing it at $133 a square foot. So land will typically be valued at per square foot or per acre or per unit of development I can get on it. So if, so if I'm valuing 48,000 square feet of land, is 133 a plausible number? Is land here in Santa Cruz less than that or is it more than that? Does anybody, or is it close enough for? A million an acre. Yeah. A million an acre? Yeah, that's pretty good though. It's but someone on the council is going to make a motion to reduce the density for no given reason, so you go from 30 to 34. You can't do that anymore. So, so we said a million an acre? Yeah, yeah. 43, 5, 16. So that's only $22 a, a, a square foot. Sorry. I think it's like 3 million an acre for residential so they want to. So they want to split. It's eighty-five thousand dollars per unit. So because it's at fifty-five, fifty-four. Okay. So if I've got thirty-two units times eighty-five, so that's two million seven divided by forty-three five sixty per acre gives me sixty-two bucks a square foot. And you think it's it's half really? So the 133 is less. If I take 85,000 a unit, you know, and I've got 32 units on here, that's at the end of the day, that's getting to $62 a square foot. No, no, it's just the land. So, so if I go to, so if my high end is three million an acre. So that's sixty-eight dollars a square foot. So it seems like at least I'm way high, right? So so if I, so if we want to err on the high side, the highest number put up was three million dollars an acre, which you think is high, maybe depending on how many units you can get on it. But if I go at that, then I'm at sixty-eight dollars a square foot. So I'm just going to say seventy here for now, right? So we think that's at least somewhere in the ballpark of land value in Santa, the city of Santa Cruz. And at some point, we'll, figure, we'll look at some other sources and kind of confirm that, okay. And then, so I've got site acquisition costs, we've got direct costs, or what are often called hard costs. If I had a building on there, I'd have demolition, right, to, to clear the building and stuff. If I have site work or infrastructure, so that off-site work, uh, I'm pricing it at uh, 40 bucks a square foot. So if, so if I have to do that, that work that's off-site, is 40 sound about right? It depends. No, it would be higher than that. It's 
construction costs are, are running about 200 square foot. Right, but site work isn't no, construction cost. Work based on the site work is scraping the land, you know, doing the, the sewer hookups. Is that, and it's mainly kind of the scraping and filling. Okay. I've got parking at about 40,000 a stall if, you were gonna, if you're going to structure parking. 60, 60, 60. 60? Yeah. If it's structured. Yeah. And I, and I put 32, so I'm parking per stall. I think your code actually can go goes below that, but we'll worry about that the later. Want more. Right. And so building costs, so, so my 32 units, I'm using an average of 872 per unit size. You know, so, so what is the It's uh, studios, ones, and twos. That's, that's really good. That's huge. Yeah. It would, it would be about 850 for one, two, and three. Okay. So we'll reduce the average size, so that reduces the gross building area, which, and I've got 260 as a hard cost, contractor cost for residential, and I've got $100 a square foot for commercial. Yeah, it's more. It's 400. Okay, 400? Because it's like $300,000 per unit. Right, well, th these numbers here, yeah. oh, you guys give, you give me yeah. a per unit cost of 654, just so you know. Right now I'm, pro I'm projecting total development cost per unit that includes land of 654. And I've got just construction costs at 548 a unit. So my math is right, why are you guys giving me all the numbers? Okay, so, so are we good with the 250 or do you want me to go higher? Okay, so so again, in a hard, in a in the in the hard cost budget, we have a general contractor overhead profit. Usually, that's about ten percent. Sometimes it's called general conditions as a separate category, but basically, the contractor is getting about ten percent. I've got a contingency in here of ten percent. Remember, contingency is not a budget category. At some point, you move money out of contingency some, to some other cost, but it's our hedge factor. So ten percent is a decent number. Start with ten percent, it goes down to five percent when you get your bids in. Yeah, you hope you hope you get it down as you get to more clarity. So I've got total hard costs in this at 13 million, which is about 478 dollars a square foot hard cost, 416 thousand per unit, just for those hard costs. That's, it's in the ballpark. Okay. So this is in the ballpark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we have what's called indirect or soft costs. So this is where if you have an architect doing a budget, they almost always never include soft costs in a budget. So this is architect engineering costs, permits and fees, taxes, insurance, legal, all those things that really aren't in the general contractor contract for the most part. So I've got architect engineering costs about 6% of direct costs. Usually those will range between five and eight. If you have soft, if you have a &E costs higher than eight, you should ask why, because that's getting pretty high. We're doing a, fire, a police station on Bainbridge Island where the architect has inserted a 15% cost in there and the city's letting them. So anything over eight, you really should question it. Uh, permits and fees, I've got about 25,000 per unit. 48,000 per unit. Taxes insurance, about 3% of direct costs. Marketing, I got 750 per unit, so I'm marketing my residential units. 1,000 thousand, thousand per unit. Okay, I'm not going to listen to that because that's not the city of Santa Cruz. <laughs> okay, we've got a development fee. So the development fee, again, is in soft costs. It's not in the hard cost budget. Uh, so I'm using 5%. That's probably a pretty good number. You can see a development fee that may be higher or maybe a little bit lower. just depends. Again, the developer fee is really a contingency. Right? The developer will usually be paid on a monthly draw you know, to cover overhead and expenses, and the balance of it is really paid when the project is done. So I've got 5%. Is that, is that too low or is that too high or what? It's usually a million two plus. Yeah. And then you, let's say it's two million, but you end up paying, putting in about a million four as a loan over 12 years. So you might get, you know, 800,000. It depends. You know? Right, but, are you, but you're talking the tax for the project. 
Yeah. So you're deferring it. Right. So your developer fee is kind of contrived because yeah. the, because right. the IRS lets you. Right. Yeah. And only about a third of it is probably paid. Correct. The rest is deferred. Okay. Right. So and that's then, about a third. And then I've got a contingency in here, you've got a five percent. Mm -hmm. So I've got three six of soft costs. That's about twenty seven percent of hard costs. So that's usually the general range. You know, if you have your soft costs well below that, you probably don't have enough of your soft costs identified. If you have soft costs that are higher, it may be because your costs are higher. But again, just gives you a, a benchmark. And then I've got financing costs. So I've got loan origination fees. I've assumed a loan of, uh, that's 70% of my development costs, so outside of land. So I didn't yet think, I didn't yet worry about what will the bank let me borrow. Uh, a lot of convention is I've got my, my direct development costs outside of land, and I'm just assuming 70% is what the bank will lend. So that's maybe a loan number, but it's 14 million. I got 2% on points, because I think that's what banks are charging these days. Uh, anybody have experience different? Is it lower or higher than that? It really depends. And it doesn't include, and it doesn't include the third party costs, so appraisals and other things. Those would be, again, in your soft costs. And then I've got construction financing, uh, again, because we're borrowing that money during construction. So I've got an interest rate of 5.5%. What rates are you guys getting now? That's okay. It might be a little higher. That's still that's good enough for now? Yeah. Okay. I'm assuming 18-month construction schedule? No, not anymore. 20, 20 months, at least 20 months. 2022, okay. yeah. So we're going to go right in there and change it? There's no way this is 20 months. So you can see what I did is one of the things that's key, and this is just a, a tutorial. You see the you see the formula up there. On your construction loan, you only pay on your construction loan the amount you actually borrow, right? I'm, I've got a loan of 14 million, but I'm only drawing it down as I need it for project costs. So I only pay interest on what I draw down. So you're not paying 100% of that interest cost for the entire term of the loan. You know, you're really kind of paying that interest over time. So if you do it right, then really it's the last month of construction where you've advanced all of your construction loans so you've minimized the interest period. And where you get into trouble is once you've drawn down your construction loan, now you're paying the maximum interest on that per month. And if it takes you longer to lease up, now your interest costs are gonna go much higher because you're paying at a much higher rate. So that's just the formula. We see a lot of people estimate construction interest in a much higher number. So I've got 20, so now I'm down that to there. 20, that 20 is without closing any tax credits, so you've got another six months after that you're turning off. Right, but this is a market project. Okay. So I haven't put any reserves in here. Again, if we're not certain, we might have reserves in the development budget, which, which means we're not sure about lease up. So once you start leasing up, you have costs you have to incur, so you need money to pay for them. So we may have, uh, and I've often seen lease up reserves that are 50% uh, of your annual costs. So you think about it, your operating expenses, you have to start paying those as soon as you're operating you know, insurance and stuff. Um, so you may need reserves in your development budget to help cover those costs until you're at full stabilization. So it's oftentimes you'll see reserves in the development budget as well as reserves in your operating budget. Key thing, it doesn't matter what the bank will loan, because the bank will loan based on your operating budget. So the more, that you, the more that's in your development budget means the more equity that you're gonna need. Because whatever adjustments get made, it doesn't change what the bank will lend, because the bank is lending based on income, not based on cost. So what that does, if, if you actually believe that these numbers are in the ballpark, so for a 32 unit project that I've cleverly called Surf Shore Apartments, since I'm from out of town, I can be cheesy with the name of my apartments. Um, I've got total costs of 21 million. So that gives me total development costs, including land of 684. Cons a total cost per unit of, of just the construction cost, the not land, is about 579 in that ballpark. Right? That's outrageous. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Um, we're actually, we actually get those same numbers in Seattle. I think this whole course is great. The most, more people you can expose this to would be the better so they actually understand how this stuff works. Uh, the only thing in this model, this is 0% inclusionary, correct? Yeah, right now we're just starting. This is a market rate project. So why, why, so why isn't the market working, right? So we've got our development costs. 
So, so we're going to carry this over. So it's, so it's a market project. So we agree the cost of 21.9 is in the ballpark, right? Right now I'm saying I think I can borrow 14 million in equity of 7.6. So the real key becomes we want to convert. Well, I want to go and exercise first. So developers are also always asking for more density, right? If you can give us more density, we can make this project work better. And you're always suspicious of that because developers always ask for that. But the reality is, is if we take this project that we just walked through the numbers, and if we are able to double the units to 64, which is not a massive project, but if we can increase the units, now there are costs that are fixed and costs that are variable. But what that does by adding more units, we now have dropped, we've increased our, our development cost by 68% to add those other units. But we've now reduced our total development cost by 21%. And the construction side of it by 10%. Because we've gotten those fixed costs spread over more units. So there actually is a cost benefit for more units. Now you have to debate politically about what's too much. But, but we just wanted to kind of do this exercise to at least show you the math is significant. And, and a project asking for more density isn't just, isn't just trying to be greedy, that some of those efficiencies actually do play out. And the unit costs are actually less because you've got more of those costs spread over those units. Okay? So, so we've got our development budget, which we'll play around with again. Now the other thing is our operating pro forma. <laughs> So this is what I've got for operating cost estimates. So I've got general operating expenses are about 4,000 a unit. I don't know if that's low or high. I've got property taxes at about 6,000 a unit. And I've got reserves at about 200 a unit. If I'm doing, if I've got commercial in my project, I'm renting probably around two, maybe, maybe 250 a square foot. And then I've got, I've got common area expenses I can pass through of 312. I've got management costs of 4%. That's my, my cost. And then we're going to Do those, do those operating expenses, does that look in the ballpark at all? For market? For market. Does anybody know? Is it good enough? I've got general operating expenses at 4,000 a unit. Property taxes at six thousand a unit. Replacement reserves at two hundred. Replacement reserves would be between four and six. Market rate. Oh, market rate. Okay. Two fifty. Yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. good enough. So the way this translates. So I got. So this I took. Our sixty-four units. Twenty-seven percent. And I've got, I've got my unit mix there. These are the rents that I was showing. So a studio at 25, a one bedroom at 3,000, a two bedroom at 4,600. Yeah, so it's, so it's kind of reflecting at least where, where are rents at, market, market rents now. I've got some laundry revenue, miscellaneous revenue coming in. So I've got gross revenue about 2.8. I've got a 7.5% vacancy. That seems high to me for Santa Cruz, but, but I, I put seven and a half. So I've got effective gross of two six. I take those expenses down, I got expenses of 652. So it gives me NOI of two, two million seventeen in that ballpark. So if I was looking at this as, as a return, you know, NOI, no bank loan, no leverage, but NOI divided by that equity, I'd be at 8%, about 8.6%. That's probably a doable project. I could probably, probably find money then. But I've looked at my, my debt service number again, I'm projecting 5.5. I've got a, so I valued it at uh, the fair market value is 40 million. But using a cap rate of 5%, which would be maybe low for Santa Cruz. So I've got my debt service in there, uh, again, so getting net cash flow of 336, which is a 3% cash on cash return. So not a great cash on cash return. You know, because bank debt is less expensive now, if you can get bank debt, you would always do that because it costs you less than an investor. 
right? So in a sense, you would always leverage your investment because at least that bank return is less than what your investor is going to require. But 3% is not a great return. You know, 3% with, with, with after-tax benefits might equate to a 6% return. So it's tight. It's tight on the, on the private side. Um, does, does that sound at all kind of in the ballpark? We're close enough for whatever. So we'll play around with that a little bit later. So the key thing we wanted to recognize, at least why isn't a lot of stuff happening in Santa Cruz? Well, because if those numbers are right, it's actually not that great a return, right? If I'm an investor, I may need more than that. And so oftentimes what you'll see, and I see this in a lot of communities, where really development is being done by your contractors, right? They're really developing real estate for their construction business. They're not really developers. And so they're taking their fees out of the construction, and then they're waiting for the project to appreciate so then they can sell it and kind of then get their money out of it. So that's a different market than if you have true developers come into play. And part of it is because your returns actually aren't that high. Right? 3%. That's, so, 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 it, so it's not like there's a lot of money being made. I think that's just the key thing. Money's being made, but not a lot. Now just for fun, because I know we're starting to wrap up, I want to look at now what does affordability do? So that was our market rate. So now we want to try and we want to start to drive the project by, based on affordability, which means that we're giving up revenue. So I went to the extreme. Let's look if we converted this project to all of those units at 30% AMI. So 30%, you know, so we, we're trying to get to very low income people. Well, if I do that, what does that do to my pro forma? It dramatically changes rent, obviously. Because now the, the rent is based on 30% of their income, not based on market value. So we've dramatically reduced our income. We haven't changed our expenses, right? Because the affordability levels don't change our operating costs. That's not necessarily true. You, well, oftentimes it'll go up. Yeah, it's 8,000 per unit per year. At, at because, because, because now you've got a project that just needs more management. Yeah, and then um, that was an end to the Right. Well, the key, the key math here is if it's very low income, now this, again, this is just a contrast, you know, worst case. Notice what happens. Our NOI is negative, right? For tax purposes, we don't have a viable project because you don't have revenues that exceed expenses. So, go ahead. But if you have, if you have people who are paying 30% of their income, that is being subsidized by the government, so the full amount is indeed being paid. It depends. It depends. I mean, what you'll end up having in this kind of a project is you'll have housing subsidies. Right? Yeah. I might have Section 8 vouchers right. that, that let me pay more, yeah. allow me to collect more, so I'm getting money from someone else. Right. Or, I'm, or even then, I still may need other housing subsidies to make sure that I can pay my costs. The key thing is if you drive your affordability too low, then you need to bring in rental subsidies because you can't, you, you can't do a project that has negative cash flow, right? So you'd end up having to subsidize it through some other means. Right. But not What? Not every unit gets subsidized. No, that's right. I mean, there's some, some places you can get Section 8 vouchers, some places you can't. Some places, some cities are prepared to provide housing services money, some places aren't. The main thing is, you, I mean, when you drive for affordability, there still is a balance that you have to achieve because you still have to have revenues exceeding expenses. Or you have to bring in money from other things. So it doesn't always solve your problems. Or you have to increase salaries. Increasing salaries would not be bad, but your, but your salaries aren't bad in some cases. I mean, in some cases they are, and sometimes much, that's a much longer term project in terms of uh, increasing wages within the workforce. Yeah. When you added the factor of the inclusionary, uh, I mean, that would be interesting to see in your model because people, some people say, well, you know, inclusionary should be 50%, but the reality is that won't pencil. Or the rates on the non inclusionary units would have to double to make up for the loss of income, the loss of rental. Right. If you started, I mean, I think the key thing from the math, not the politics, is that if you started to, to require rents to be set in a different way, then, then the impact is going to be going to be it's going to reduce income to a certain point. The question becomes, is that still okay, right? I mean, a lot there's a lot of zoning programs that look at providing zoning bonuses to give you more units 
to help offset the ones that are being set aside for low income. But, it, but the math of it could be pretty straightforward. Um, but obviously, well, I'm not dealing with inclusion right now. But for now, it sounds like, at least from you in the room, that this development budget and this operating pro forma, not the 30%, is at least in the ballpark. So if we wanted to start playing around with it to start looking at different ways in which we can make that math work better, then at least we're, in, we're using the right starting point, right? And you'll all sign an affidavit certifying that? Okay. There's a form at the back of the room. Um, so you can't yell later when we come out and say, oh, that, that's just not expensive enough for okay? So thank you for your patience. You know, hopefully it wasn't too boring for you at the first start, but we wanted to give you a good overview just of real estate. This is how the math works. The books will give you a lot more detail. We didn't play around with algebra as much as we would normally play around with uh, in our classes and stuff, but it gives you a feel for pushing numbers around. And at the end of the day, it's a math exercise, you know, you know that, to, to be able to solve your problems. Bonnie, yeah, last words? Um, I would just say I hope I hope you enjoy this. We're thinking about doing a housing 201. I will also say part of what we'd like to do as a next step is to talk about projects from the various perspectives of how they actually get financed for affordable housing projects and also what role the city has in that. So we'll give you some examples of some projects that we finance, including the one that just um, had its grand opening over the weekend on Water Street. So that project we had between 4.6 in loans and grants and some additional funding, about 5.1 million in that project um, to help with the affordability. And overall, that comes out to about 125,000 per unit as a subsidy from the, from the city. So um, it varies widely. We have other examples of the Tannery, Limburg Street Apartments, other projects that the city has invested in over the years. So that's something that we can provide as sort of a of a housing, affordable housing uh, 201 um, that we'd like to, to provide next in the series. So thank you for coming today. And um, we will send out actually some of the uh, answers um, to the uh, some of the questions and exercises in your packet. Um, so if you're